was the largest wolf that ever stalked the earth. A powerful and tenacious predator. The dire wolf killed to survive in a savage ice age world. Hunting in packs, it evolved into an expert killer, dominating the landscape of the Pleistocene era, which began almost two million years ago and ended just 10,000 years ago. But suddenly, in an instant of geological time, this fierce and formidable hunter vanished. In a world where the strong survived, the powerful dire wolf mysteriously perished, while its smaller, weaker cousin, the grey wolf, prevailed. Did the dire wolf run out of food? Or did some overwhelming force drive it into oblivion? Los Angeles, home to a concrete jungle ruled by the movers and shakers of showbiz. But just 10,000 years ago, a very different kind of predator dominated the Hollywood Hills. It was the end of the Ice Age, a geological period known as the Pleistocene. The last of the glaciers were receding and an extraordinary assortment of mammals walked the Earth. Not since the age of dinosaurs, 65 million years before, had so many creatures of such great size and strength roamed the North American continent. There were sloths the size of bears, mammoths standing more than 12 feet tall. Feeding on these monsters were the hypercarnivores. Killers like the giant short-faced bear and the saber-toothed cat. You step out of your time machine 10,000 years ago, and North America is going to be a furry nightmare. This was the domain of the dire wolf, a massive dog-like creature that hunted in killer packs of 30 or more. This marauding meat-eater was able to attack prey 10 times its size and fight off much larger predators at the same time. You just can't be beaten down because you just have the endurance and the stamina and the ferocity to scare or exhaust the opponent into submission. Having thrived for more than a hundred thousand years, all that's left of this once mighty hunter is a pile of ancient bones. Bubbling up in the heart of Hollywood, the La Brea Tar Pits are a kind of prehistoric mass grave the biggest collection of Ice Age animal bones in the world. The remains of thousands of dire wolves have been found in the preserving tar, part of a staggering hoard of more than a million bones from more than 200 prehistoric species. The pools of naturally occurring tar make the area unique. Over the ages, the black syrupy material acted as a perfect preserving agent and a deadly animal trap. In prehistoric times, molten asphalt, or tar deep inside the earth, oozed its way to the top. As it broke through, a harmless black crust formed as the tar cooled. But when exposed to the summer heat, the crust melted again, and the tar pits became an inescapable bluey trap for any unfortunate animal that wandered in. The remains of more than 500 stranded horses and bison have been found in these pits. But surprisingly, these herbivores are outnumbered by meat-eating predators. Thousands of them have been found in the pits. Usually herbivores outnumber predators by around 10 to 1 in any given location. But in the tar pits, it's the exact opposite. The predators vastly outnumber the plant eaters. Why? Experts believe opportunistic predators like dire wolves were drawn into the tar pits by stranded prey, only to find themselves trapped in even greater numbers. This scenario repeated itself over the ages until all that remained was layer upon layer of preserved blackened bones. To an expert eye, a jumble of bones can be read like evidence from an ancient crime scene. 
Clues preserved in the tar can reveal how individual animals lived and died. Five meters below the present day surface lies 40,000 year old bones from various animals, including the dire wolf. The quality of preservation is excellent and the diversity that we have found within this site is second to none. Right here, exposed at the bottom of this one grid site here, we have a vertebra of a short-faced bear. And right here, we have a dire wolf humerus, which is the upper arm bone, with nice juicy asphalt coming off of it. The dire wolf was discovered after bones from the tar pits were cleaned and pieced together. It proved to be the largest canid, or species of dog, that ever lived. Averaging just under two meters long, almost a meter tall, and around 70 kilograms, the beast was given the Latin name Canis Dyrus, or Dire Wolf. It is by far the most common species uncovered at the tar pit excavations. More than three and a half thousand dire wolves have been found. Compared to just 2,000 saber-toothed cats. Experts believe the large number of dire wolf bones proves they were social animals, perhaps running in packs of 30 or more. They also believe the dire wolf thrived over its closest Ice Age relative, the grey wolf. Dire wolves far outnumber greys in the tar pits by three and a half thousand to fifteen. The dire wolf had been dominating the grey for hundreds of thousands of years before it suddenly vanished. Its seemingly inferior cousin, the grey, prevailed. The answer to this prehistoric mystery lies in the ancient bones of these two relatives of the household dog. Anatomy is often destiny. and Anatomy often tells a story about what actually worked for an animal or for a species for a long time. And the anatomy of the Pleistocene mammals gives us very good pictures of Pleistocene behaviors. At first glance, the two wolves seem almost identical, suggesting they acted much the same. But a closer anatomical investigation of the two reveals small yet critical differences. The most obvious difference is the dire wolf's larger jaw and teeth. Paleontologists believe this would have created a much stronger bite, evolved to bring down the larger Ice Age mammals like bison and horse. Researchers compared other bones and discovered other important differences between the two species. The dire wolf's humerus, or upper arm bone, is slightly longer, but significantly thicker than that of the grey. So too is the ulna, or one of the two lower arm bones. That demonstrates that the dire wolf was a more powerfully built animal, weighing up to half as much more than the grey wolf. The lighter grey wolf bones suggest it was sleeker and probably faster on foot. These subtle differences are significant in that they indicate these similar creatures hunted differently. Every animal has a style of attack determined by its build. Bears use their size and strength to overwhelm their prey. The cheetah has its speed and agility while the lion is armed with powerful claws and suffocating bite. The wolf uses its weight and jaws to bring down prey. In both cases, the dire wolf held the advantage over the grey. But by how much? To find out, researchers turn to another, more accessible member of the canid family, the common household dog and a team of expert handlers, including film and TV animal coordinator Joe Camp, and professional guard dog trainers Lauren Williams and Brian Hill. Together, they examined the attack behavior of four different dogs 
to see how each breed's unique build determines the manner and power of its attack. The bulldog makes his bite and then uses his body not only to wrestle the animal to the ground, but he's actually twisting his bite to cause more pain. The mastiff totally uses nothing but its weight. Its attack was head on, slam into with his body, get a grip, and down you go. The other two breeds, the Malinois and the Dutch Shepherd, are similar in shape and good matches for the ancient gray wolf and its larger cousin, the dire wolf. The Malinois, being a lighter dog, uses the momentum or its speed and coordination to pull its prey down. I think the Dutch Shepherd combined all the best traits of all the different styles. He hurled himself, therefore getting momentum. He opened his mouth as wide as he could, similar to the Malinois, got that good solid bite. His weight slammed into the prey, just like the bigger dogs. Very similar to the modern wolf and probably the dire wolf, too. The more vigorous attack of the Dutch Shepherd hints at the advantage the dire wolf had over its lighter gray cousin. It may have used its more massive body to take down larger prey. As well as its superior size, the dire wolf's other main advantage was its massive head and jaw. A custom-made bite meter can measure the strength of a dog bite. Using the device, the trainers can work out the relationship between the size of an animal's jaw and the force of its bite. What we have here is a digital bite meter, and the sensor has a gap in it. When the dog bites it, it closes the gap. You know, the readout over here tells you how, much, how many pounds of force the dog is applying. As each dog was lured into biting the device, an obvious relationship between jaw size and biting power soon emerged. Although the Dutch Shepherd's head is only slightly larger than the Malinois, its bite is much stronger. 195. It was a 195. I got it to a maximum of 224 right now, but it was up to about 230. And the Mega Jord Mastiff outbit them all. That's the Mastiff. Whoa! 556. That, that is, that's amazing. A lot more than I expected. The numbers demonstrated that a slight increase in the size of a dog's head makes for a significantly stronger bite. So the same must have applied to prehistoric wolves. It's obviously impossible to measure the bite of an extinct animal. But it seems the dire wolf's bigger head and jaws meant it had a much stronger bite than its gray cousin. This superior bite and a more robust attack style probably meant the dire wolf could bring down much larger prey. Larger, stronger, the dire evolved into a kind of super wolf with the muscle and might to take on the largest of Ice Age giants. Yet it would fade into oblivion while the smaller, weaker gray wolf would survive. What was it that toppled this super wolf from the top of the premier predator league, relegating the once mighty dire wolf to extinction? The dire wolf dominated much of North and South America for more than 100,000 years. Yet, no direct descendant of the dire wolf survives today. During its time on Earth, it was competing with a cousin, the gray wolf. Canis lupus, more commonly known as the gray wolf, has hardly changed over the 10,000 years since its competitor died out. While the dire wolf and other large Ice Age mammals died out, the gray thrived as the powerful predator it is today. 
The physical attributes of gray wolves that allow them to be such effective hunters is their speed, is their endurance, their persistence. I mean, they will not quit until they acquire that meal. Every one of these traits comes into play as wolves often take on animals more than four times their size. Most greys weigh up to 45 kilograms, while a bull elk can weigh more than six times as much. What wolf hunting behavior is all about, the guiding principle is to kill without being killed. Prey are dangerous and can kill wolves. And as a result, they have to be sensitive to the threat posed by the prey animal they encounter. And they assess that threat. With the risk of injury or death looming at each encounter, gray wolves take advantage of their social nature. Like their long lost cousins, the dire wolves, the greys use sophisticated pack behavior to hunt. There's six primary stages that they go through, starting from the time they set out to go searching for prey to the time they actually grab and kill the animal. And so it begins with searching or traveling. This is say they encounter a herd, then they'll begin to approach that herd. Speed and endurance are the wolves' greatest assets. The key to a successful hunt is to get their prey running. Patient and cunning, the wolves spread out, waiting for the herd to break. Once their targets are on the move, it will be easier to identify and zero in on the stragglers. Elk tend to flee in multiple directions in, in groups. And so you have wolves going in multiple directions, looking through the herd for that vulnerable individual. Sharp eyes and instincts, fine-tuned over tens of thousands of years of evolution, quickly identify a target that's too injured or old to keep up. The moment a straggler is spotted, the rest of the pack joins in to chase the unfortunate individual. So maybe you started with one wolf, now that you've got a half a dozen wolves that are running after this elk. Like a kind of relay race, each wolf works to keep the elk on the run, relentlessly wearing it down. Closing in for the kill, the lead wolf will use its formidable jaws to lock on and bring the target down long enough for the rest of the pack to catch up and join in the kill. The key hardware that wolves have in their mouths are the canines. Those canines are critical to grabbing and keeping a hold of an animal. So other wolves allow other wolves to go in and bite. A wolf's canine teeth are pronounced and are designed to lock on to prey. But hanging on to a thrashing quarter-ton elk isn't easy. Often. An elk is strong enough to slip away, but wolves are determined, coordinated hunters. What they'll do is they'll rally, they'll socialize, they'll team up, they'll huddle up, and there'll be a period of excitement, and you'll hear howling, if like you hear just here, where there's a lot of barking and excitement like that, and then they'll sort of get their courage back up again, and then they'll initiate another attack. A hungry wolf pack will make repeated attacks, searching for that weak individual. Once the lead wolf's bite penetrates the muscles of a target, the wound will slow it down enough to allow the other wolves to join in. One animal grabs it and then another, and they all grab on. They're able to, to, to hold it in place. That allows another animal to take multiple bites out of it and start biting it and bleeding it and start to eat the animal. Only around one in 10 pursuits will end in a kill. For these gray wolves, hunting isn't a sport, but a constant fight for survival. As for the dire wolf, its physical similarity to the gray suggests it hunted and ate much like its cousin, with one big advantage. The more muscular features of a dire wolf may have provided them more killing power, an ability to physically overpower a prey animal in a way that modern-day wolves just cannot do. 
Hunting in packs of 30 or more, dire wolves presented a menacing threat. I think there's nothing that's going to be more frightening to a prey species than to see well-organized, intelligent wolves in a large group moving at a high speed with a lot of endurance coming straight after a target that's been specifically selected. The dire wolf's powerful build, massive jaws and teeth suggest it feasted on the largest of prey, like mammoth or bison. Only its bones have survived over the thousands of years since it vanished. New state-of-the-art analysis of these bones may be able to confirm exactly what the dire wolf was eating some 12,000 years ago. It's called stable isotopic analysis. It can detect specific chemical signatures that individual plants left behind in the bones of animals that ate them. By identifying the kind of plant signatures in a bone, experts can tell what kind of animal it was and the environment in which it lived. When plant eaters are eaten by meat eaters, the chemical signatures stored in the bones of the herbivores are transferred to the bones of the carnivores. By detecting and analyzing these ancient chemical signatures still locked inside meat eaters' bones, scientists can work out what animals it ate. And that's exactly what researchers have done with hundreds of dire wolf bones recovered from the La Brea tar pits. We see that they were eating small percentages, probably of things like sloths and mastodons. So about half their diet was bison, and about half of their diet was horse. The isotopic analysis determined that while the dire wolf was hunting down larger dangerous animals like bison and horse, it was ignoring smaller, safer targets like elk and deer. Why it did this remains a mystery. Perhaps the large packs needed larger quantities of food. Were there hidden advantages for taking on large herbivores? No one knows. Either way, the dire wolf went after the most dangerous game it could find, at considerable risk. 10,000 years ago, on the prehistoric continent of North America, dire wolves were constantly on the prowl. They adopted the risky strategy of hunting larger, potentially dangerous prey. Taking on a large target like a horse would sooner or later bring injury or death to one of the pack. The same potential hazards can be seen today as grey wolves continue the age-old struggle with prey like the bison. Bison are very formidable, very dangerous. And so in the wintertime, when there's deep snows, wolves can corner bison in areas where they are less effective at defending themselves. Even with a stranded bison, the wolves take special care. These encounters can last days, where they'll have a bull bison isolated on a patch of bare ground surrounded by snow on all sides, and that bison will basically fight to the end, and the wolves will just keep after it. This battle lasted for 36 hours. Over that time, the besieged bison endured continual harassment as the wolves worked together to wear the giant beast down. But the strength and surprising agility of the bison makes it a dangerous adversary. The incidence of injury, we think, is higher with wolves hunting bison. They'll often be kicked off, or if the bison continues to wheel about, the bison will throw them into the air. Maybe the bison will hook him with her, his horns and toss him into the air. You see a lot more limping wolves than you do wolves that are hunting elk, and that's likely been sustained from some encounter with the bison. In this case, despite the bison's desperate struggles, the wolves' tenacity finally paid off. The gray wolf faces this kind of danger every time it hunts for larger prey. Given the even greater strength and bulk of Ice Age herds, such a hunt must have been even more perilous for the dire wolf. Its apparent tendency to hunt in large packs might have mitigated the danger, but only up to a point. Countless victims of flying hooves or thrashing horns litter the fossil records. 
Thousands of smashed dire wolf bones have been recovered, and each has a story to tell. Analysis of ancient injuries can reveal fascinating detail about life in a dire wolf pack. This is an example of a rather serious injury that this animal lived with for a while. This is actually the ulna and the radius, which is this portion of your arm. And a normal ulna would look like so, and the radius would be a separate bone. And what's happened to this animal apparently is it was probably kicked or had some terrible injury which broke one or both bones. And so the two bones are now fused together, which probably created some pain for this animal in terms of motion and also some stiffness. A break like this, most likely the result of a savage kick, would have left the wolf hobbling on three legs. Unable to hunt with the rest of the pack, it likely survived on leftovers. Growth around the original break shows the wolf lived on for several years after the injury, suggesting it was embraced rather than shunned by the rest of the group. This is unusual pack behavior. Unlike modern gray wolves, it may be that the dire wolves took care of their own. More signs of this unique behavior may also be hidden in a crushed dire wolf skull. The damage is evidence of serious trauma that would have caused significant disfigurement. A normal wolf skull is smooth and symmetrical with rounded eye openings. It's likely the injured wolf was trampled by a horse or bison. The blow crushed the skull, dislocated the eye and caused severe brain damage. But surprisingly, it wasn't these injuries that killed the animal. Significant bone growth covering the wound indicates this wolf lived at least five months after the trauma. As the skull was found in the tar pits, researchers can conclude that it wasn't the head injury, but an ill-fated foray into the gluey tar that killed the injured individual. The non-fatal injuries were too severe for this wolf to have survived on its own. For many experts, this is additional proof that not only did dire wolves live in packs, but they actually cared for one another. However, other scars on this same dire wolf skull show that fellow wolves weren't always cooperative, but also vicious and cruel. We have bite marks. Here's one right here. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of right there. And then there's another one corresponding right here. So this would have been a bite that kind of came around this way. The bite marks are signs of dire wolf aggression, probably within the pack. There's a lot of what I call wolf-on-wolf -wolf crime at Rancho La Brea. There's a lot of bites by dire wolves on dire wolves. These marks reflect similar behavior often seen in modern gray wolves. There is often a strict hierarchy within a gray wolf pack. The strongest, fiercest males and females occupy what's known as the alpha roles. A constant struggle for dominance within the pack can lead to fierce, sometimes deadly battles. After a kill, individuals reinforce their position in the pecking order. Growling and biting are the simplest ways for a wolf to assert itself. Bite marks on ancient dire wolf bones suggest that in this respect, their behavior wasn't so different from today's gray wolves. Other similarities in behavior can be deduced by studying the remains of those dire wolves that became stranded in the La Brea Tar. Experts believe these animals became trapped while hunting in large packs. But almost all of the bones found in the pits belong to adult wolves. Surprisingly few are from pups. Why? Researchers believe it shows that dire wolves treated their pups similar to the way modern gray wolves do theirs.
During the first six months of a gray wolf's life, it remains in a protected area, known as a rendezvous site. Adults bring food to the pup until it's old enough to fend for itself. I believe that the dire wolves were in fact rendezvousing their young and that they were not showing up for scavenging or for hunting until they were at least six months old. This indicates the pack behavior of the dire wolf was closely related to the greys. And the parallel between the two species continues to one of the cornerstones of predatory life. The threat from other predators. In the world of the carnivore, competition for prey is fierce. And after a kill, a second conflict over the carcass begins. Stealing a carcass from another carnivore is one of the primary modes of competition among large meat eaters. Such battles are commonly seen in the African bush. A predator must learn to protect its kill from scavengers or starve to death. For the modern grey wolf, the grizzly bear is one of the fiercest competitors. In Yellowstone, so far, grizzly bears are 100% successful in usurping carcasses from wolves. And wolves very infrequently put up a stiff resistance. They pretty much let the bears take the carcass. For grey wolves, it's a critical waste of energy after an exhaustive hunt to have food snatched away. It's likely the dire wolf suffered the same kind of competition from short-faced bears and saber-toothed cats. It was a constant struggle to find and secure enough food to keep the pack alive. When confronted by larger competitors, it's likely the dire wolves would have avoided trouble. Most likely, what they're probably doing is, uh, like in, in Enter the Dragon, what Bruce Lee says, the art of fighting without fighting. That's what they're doing. They're trying to compete for some of the same prey resources, but by not actually directly confronting Smilodon, Short-Faced Bear, probably working around them. They're competing without competing. But there were times when the dire wolf was forced to confront his larger competition. Unfortunately for the wolf, the rules of nature favor the larger species. In a one-on-one -on -one encounter, the short-faced bear or saber-toothed cat would overwhelm a wolf. This made life for the smaller dire wolf extremely difficult. Powerful predators that roamed the Ice Age terrain tormented them at every kill and threatened to leave them out in the cold. Yet the dire wolf thrived for hundreds of thousands of years. Despite competition for food from fearsome adversaries like saber-toothed cats, and short-faced bears, beasts that most likely took on and defeated even the largest of dire wolf packs. Fortunately for the dire wolves, short-faced bear populations were small and such encounters should have been rare. But clashes with the more numerous saber-toothed cat were far more likely. This fierce feline weighed a quarter of a ton or more. Fast, strong, and armed with a fearsome array of teeth. A lone dire wolf would probably retreat. But in a pack, strength in numbers would probably defeat a single cat. They're most likely in concert in, in a very threatening type of posturing way. A single Smilodon can't be looking everywhere at once. And even though they're all smaller than you, 
the numbers and the proximity is probably going to suggest that there's some fights that are just not worth having. Operating in large packs gave the direwolf another major advantage over its competitors. It meant they could devour their prey quickly before other carnivores had a chance to steal the kill. They had to worry about losing their carcasses and it would benefit them to finish the carcass entirely and eat very rapidly. I think it was a major element. I think it would have favored very large group size and it's actually gonna enhance the speed at which they can eat. Individually, each wolf used its massive jaw muscles and oversized front teeth to quickly pull off huge chunks of flesh. Its rear teeth were adapted for tearing, not chewing, so they simply swallowed the meal whole. It was kind of remarkable how little chewing went on. They just reach in, mainly with their incisors and the canine teeth, and pull out a hunk of muscle, and down the gullet it would go. Maybe one bite, and then down the gullet it would go. Wolfing down their food. A dire wolf pack made short work of a kill. They could reduce a huge bison into bones in just minutes before another predator had the opportunity to move in. This was just another of the crucial skills the dire wolf evolved to survive among other Ice Age beasts. It became a sturdy, relentless hunter with the size and strength to overwhelm massive prey like the bison. It learned to work in large packs to fend off other predators. As a result, the dire wolf spread across North America in large numbers, dominating other species like its cousin, the gray. Then why, after more than a hundred thousand years of success, did it suddenly disappear from the face of the earth? And how did its smaller cousin, the gray wolf, survive? It's a question that sparked a long and vigorous debate. Extinction theory is a competitive sport among paleontologists, and the Ice Age in particular is like the Olympics of that competitive sport. The best-known theory focuses on severe climate change, blaming the glaciers that came and went across North America for more than a million years. During these periods of glaciation, experts suggest temperatures in Florida never reached higher than five degrees Celsius. Then, about 18,000 years ago, the last of the glaciers receded. Cool, forested landscapes transformed into a moderate, drier climate. The dire wolves did not adapt well to this warmer, drier world. And this is one of the oddities of the Pleistocene, is that it's an environment at 10,000 years, and it should be the animals are being more expansive in terms of their range and their resources, and yet they're not. Species after species faded into oblivion, even though they had survived several severe climatic changes in the past. Why did all of these large herbivores and large carnivores like the dire wolf manage to survive these climatic changes throughout the Pleistocene, and suddenly they become extinct at the end of the last ice age? Perhaps the climatic change at the end of the last ice age was much more abrupt, and that may have played a key role in the restructuring of the ecosystem. One theory suggests this abrupt change came as a result of a comet that exploded over North America 10,000 years ago. Evidence supporting such a rapid change can be found in the fossil record. Thousands of dire wolf teeth have been found at the La Brea Tar Pits. These teeth can tell experts a lot about what individuals were eating at the time. For example, cracked or broken teeth suggest individuals were chewing on bones. That means meat was scarce. Perhaps a famine sparked by a catastrophic event. The kinds of bones that these dire wolves were eating were you know, cow bones and up, very, very large bones that took quite a bit of bite force, and so you might end up cracking a tooth in the process. It's not hard to find a cracked tooth. 
or for that matter hundreds of broken teeth among the La Brea direwolf fossils. They suggest the wolves were chewing on bones. But evidence for the extinction theory wasn't clear until the bones were dated and placed on a timeline. The timeline showed wolves were breaking their teeth much more often 15,000 years ago than they were 12,000 years ago. If climate change was killing off the dire wolf's prey, the timeline should show an increasing incidence of bone crunching and teeth cracking. But the timeline study shows just the opposite, that the prey animals were plentiful until the very end. These results support the idea that dire wolves didn't gradually die out but suffered a relatively sudden and unexpected end. Recent evidence seems to suggest, based on dating of the last occurrence of these various extinct megafauna, that it did happen fairly quickly, and maybe in a matter of hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years. In evolutionary terms, a thousand years is a blink of an eye. Such a catastrophic extinction can't be explained by climatic change alone. Was it a comet or the rise of another species that would go on to dominate the planet? The beginning of the end for many of the largest Pleistocene mammals came around 10,000 years ago. The Ice Age was ending. The frozen tundra was rapidly disappearing from the landscape. The dire wolf was coping with yet another change in climate, and a new and dangerous predator had burst onto the scene. I think climatic change played the greatest role in the restructuring of the ecosystem at the end of the last ice age. But you cannot deny that humans had some impact. Humans made their way across the Bering Land Bridge. With each step, the end of the dire wolf grew nearer. If you look at the last 100,000 years, and especially in this part of North America, the two big 900-pound gorillas that are sitting there occupying that window are ice and humans. They're affecting everything. They're bringing in not just Clovis spear points and fire and large-sized brains, they're probably bringing all sorts of things with them. It's thought man began to excessively hunt and kill the large prey, reducing the food supply for the large carnivores. But the damage wreaked by humans may have been more extreme. Another new theory suggests they introduced new deadly diseases. As humans encroach, and as they bring with them whatever it is they bring with them, they're probably bringing diseases, and most likely those types of infections or microorganisms are affecting everything they come in contact with. And I think that probably knocks out just most of the large species. It is possible that humans took a devastating toll on the large mammals. Add to that a dramatic change in climate, and an entire ecosystem can be forced to adapt. If it happened slowly, perhaps many of the large animals would have survived. But the ecological upheaval magnified the shortcomings of every living species. During those last years, the dire wolf was fighting off extinction. The fierce competition from the other large carnivores was getting worse as they clashed over the same diminishing prey. But his smaller cousin, the grey wolf, adapted to the situation. For almost 100,000 years, grey wolves were found in many of the same areas as the dire wolf. But these greys were found in much fewer numbers. The grey probably maintained its distance from the larger dire wolf packs and focused its attention on smaller prey, adapting into a more agile, versatile hunter, able to survive a new world populated by humans. They're highly flexible in their behavior, and that's absolutely essential to their survival. And that largely explains why they've ranged so widely in terms of geographic distribution. The gray wolf's flexibility is still evident today. They are able to hunt down prey from the largest of bison to small mice. They have also expanded their diet to include fish. 
it's helped make them a top predator. As for the direwolf, it appears size was not everything. As opposed to what humans often think, which is bigger is better, there's often a benefit, an evolutionary benefit to smaller size. And smaller size often means more flexibility in terms of what it is you're doing out in the landscape. The flexibility of the smaller gray wolf allowed it to adapt and vary its hunting behavior. But the dire wolf continued to hunt in large packs for only the largest beasts. When the quickly changing ecosystem favored a different lifestyle, it was unable to adjust. Around 10,000 years ago, the dire wolf, along with almost every large mammal of the Pleistocene, faded from the ancient landscape. I think they went extinct because they were specialized for large prey, and the large prey were removed, apparently, by combination of humans and climate change. The dire wolf thrived amid more than 100,000 years of vicious competition. But the size and numbers that made it so successful would ultimately seal its fate. Unable to adapt, when the huge animals it hunted declined, the dire wolf went down with them. Now, all that's left to remind the world of the reign of this once fearsome predator is a pile of bones in a Hollywood tar pit. <laughs>